know, I would be an absolute fool to stand up here and think that I had anything to say if I did not think that I was speaking the words of God and not speaking from God's Word. And you would be just as foolish to sit there and to listen to me uh, if these are my opinions and this is not the thus saith the Lord from this text. And so uh, this morning you're finding your way to Isaiah chapter 7. I believe that's page 606 in your pew Bible. If you're turning there, unless you preach, uh, you may consider listening to God's Word, listening to a sermon as a passive activity, since you are not the one that is actively doing something, and uh, you could not be more incorrect. Uh, a sermon, the giving of God's Word, um, involves uh, five different parties. It involves the spirit that inspired the word. It involves the son who the word points to. It involves God the Father who is my audience this morning. It involves the preacher who is allowing the spirit uh, to operate in him and to give the word of God precisely so that it might honor God and lift up Jesus. And then it also involves the congregation who is actively hearing God's word. It's not something that you can do uh, passively. Jesus tells us in the parable of the sower, after he gives that parable, he says this in Luke 8, 18. Consider carefully how you listen. Consider carefully how you listen. And in that parable, uh, the, Jesus tells us that if we, if we listen in one way, we will be given more. But then he also says if we listen in another way, a negative way, uh, even what we think we have, uh, that will be taken from us. So it's very important uh, that we are active hearers of God's word. I, I take this as serious business. The preaching of God's word is a matter of life and death. Eternal souls hang in the balance. And, uh, and so... You see, God's Word is not something to just read. It is not just something to hear. It is something to believe. It is something to obey. And so, so far, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, we have seen that Isaiah has presented to us uh, God in several different fashions and in several different ways. He's told us uh, that He is the Holy Lord of hosts. He is the mighty one of Israel, and last week we saw that he was the branch of the Lord. So Isaiah is giving us those uh, offerings uh, to help us to understand God and his, his full uh, being. And so how does God speak to us today? Well, God speaks to us through his word. That's the way that God speak to, speaks to us. We might have heard somebody say before, well... I would like to hear God speak out loud. Well, he speaks out loud through his word. If you want to hear an audible voice, then read the word of God out loud, and then you'll hear the word of God out loud. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, is an important verse uh, for the inspiration of Scripture and uh, what revelation is all about. I'm not talking about the last book of the Bible. I'm talking about the process of how God gave his word. This is what Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, which would be right now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So God's spoken in a lot of different ways uh, through many different means, uh, events, historical uh, happenings, uh, through baskets of fruit, through a swimming axe head, through signs and wonders, through all sorts of things in the Bible. But ultimately, he speaks to us in this day in the fulfillment of his son, Jesus Christ. He is the... He is the perfect, he is the absolute revelation of God. And so, in this passage, I hope to point this out. Also in this passage, this is, this is uh, 
It's not a difficult passage, but it is difficult to keep it in context because we like to think about this passage in another way. And I'm going to try to keep it in the context of when Isaiah said it. And so you're there in chapter 7. Our main text is verses 10 through 17, but we'll refer to some of those verses before. The year is 735 B.C. Ahaz is the king of Judah. He is about to hit the panic button. Assyria, uh, his neighbor to the north, uh, is the world power. They are the dominant world power. It's not Babylon. It's not Egypt. It's not Greece. It's not Rome. It's Assyria. And they're up there to the north. And Syria and Israel are worrying about Assyria. And so they ask Ahaz, would you come join us so that we can defeat Assyria because they're threatening. And uh, Ahaz says, no, I'm not going to do that. I fear Assyria more than I fear uh, y'all too. And so what happens is Israel and Syria turn on Ahaz uh, king of Judah, and they are going to fight him. And in verse 2, uh, what we find out is this. Ahaz believes that his destruction is imminent and that it is going to happen. It is, uh, it is a certainty. And uh, verse 2 tells us that he's scared to death. And so because he's scared to death, verse 3 tells us that God sends the prophet Isaiah and his son, uh, Shear Yeshub, uh, to Ahaz to talk him off the ledge. Now, what, what possible word could he give to him? Well, uh, just the fact that he's bringing his son along, Shear Yeshub means that there will be a remnant. And so just the fact that he brings his son along is a sermon in and of itself. And so that's supposed to calm Ahaz down. And Ahaz, uh, Isaiah tells them that Israel's and Syria's bark is uh, worse than their bite. Uh, there in verse uh, 3, it says that they are more smoke than they are fire. And then by the time you get to verse 7... God promises Ahaz that the alliance against him would fail. And in just a few short 13 years, Assyria is going to consume the whole northern kingdom, the ten tribes up to the north. Assyria will consume them, hence the ten lost tribes of Israel and the creation of the uh, province of Samaria that we see in the New Testament. All that's going to happen in just a matter of about a decade. And so final deliverance is only going to come through one that is revealed here to Isaiah, and his name is Emmanuel. Now, if only Ahaz would believe God's word. But the question is, will he? That's the big question. See, as we leave this day, and as we delve into this passage, what we are going to find is this. This will be true of us because it was true of them. The word of God blesses those who believe it and it judges those who do not. Now let me repeat that again. Let me, let me just punctuate the seriousness of the hour. Let me highlight the preaching of God's word. The word of God blesses those who believe. And it judges those who do not. So that's a big onus on the pulpit this morning. And that's a big onus on the pew this morning. Because it's either going to bless you or it's going to end up judging you one day. And so I want to give you this morning three undeniable truths from this text about the Word of God and our response to it. And by the way, as we interact with the Word of God, it always requires a response. There is never a time that you can be neutral about the Word of God. It always requires a response. And so, first of all, in verses 10 and 11, what we want to see is this first undeniable truth. 
Revelation is a gracious gift of God. Revelation, the, the self-giving of God of information about him is a gift of God. What you are holding in your hand is revelation. The Bible is God's revelation. That is a gift from God. Now Isaiah is a prophet. Uh, his faith in the Lord's promises was practical for him. Uh, in the here and now, it wasn't just something that was futuristic and down the road. Prophets were, by and large, foretellers of God's word. They were not foretellers of God's word. And by that, I mean this. The prophet's job, basically, was to be a preacher, not a predictor of future events. Now, usually when we think of prophet, we think of somebody that's prophesying about the future. Well, I'm telling you right now, these guys were preaching to the people of their day. And that was, by and large, their ministry was to preach to the people of their day. Isaiah could have cared less about Assyria and Syria and Israel and for that matter even Judah. He wasn't concerned with political cleverness. He wasn't concerned with military might. He could care less about the elections in November. He certainly was not interested in Washington DC. What he was interested in was answering this question. Could God's word be trusted? Could God's word be trusted, especially when you've got invaders all around you that are plotting your demise? Look at verse 9 there. This is the Lord speaking to Ahaz. This kind of sums up his whole dialogue up to this point. And the Lord says to Ahaz, If you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. Now, I don't know about you and where you came from, but that's kind of an ultimatum. Either you will express faith or you're not going to be here. That's what verse 9 is saying. If you stand firm in your faith, if you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. And so, like a drowning man, God throws Ahaz a lifeline to fortify his faith. Because earlier we found out that he's just scared to death. He's not believing. He's not following the Lord. And so verse 10 and verse 11 is the beginning of that lifeline. Look with me. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. Notice all caps for Lord, Yahweh. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, the king. Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as the heaven. Now, something there about verse 11. Uh, it's, a, it's a gracious offering from the Lord, to be sure. Uh, but that first word in verse 11 is an imperative command. God is telling him to ask for a sign. Uh, not to, do, you, do you ever get infuriated? Can you do that as a Christian? Do you ever get uh, bothered when you buy a car? Or, I remember the first house I bought. And uh, we, we went to the mortgage place to do all the paperwork. And they bought out a stack of papers about that thick. And you remember uh, all the fine detail, right, down in the bottom? Like, I'm going to read all of that. So... When he says here, ask for a sign, he's not talking about the fine detail down in the bottom. 
He's not talking about a footnote. What he is talking about here is a billboard that is just blaring. It's obvious to see to all. He says, ask for a sign from the Lord your God, from Yahweh, God Almighty. And he refers to him here as he makes this offering such that it's, he's your God, right? And then he says, listen to this qualifier. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. What in the world does that mean? Uh, well, what in the world that means is this. Sheol is just another word for the grave. So he says, it can be as deep as the grave or as high as the heaven. So what he's saying is, you can ask for a sign and there are absolutely no limits to what I am offering you. Wow. Ask for a sign and you can have anything you want, God says. See, the sign here was a word. The sign would be the revelation of God to Ahaz and the people of Judah. And anytime God reveals himself to men he expects man or woman, boy or girl, to interact with the Word of God. And anytime you interact with the Word of God, something is taking place. Neutral, you cannot be. The Word of God describes itself in this way. In Hebrews 4.12, it says the Word of God is a sword. So when you interact with the Word of God, you know what it does? It slices and it dices. And it performs surgery on your heart. Because that's what the Word of God does when you come in contact with it. The Word of God also refers to itself in Jeremiah 23, 9. It says, God's Word is like a fire. So when you read God's Word, you know what happens? The dross in your life is burn up. And the coldness in your heart is somehow warmed up when you come in contact with the Word of God. That same verse says the Word of God is like a hammer. Now, a hammer can serve two functions. It can either, either pulverize you or it can be used with a chisel to somehow form you. See, you cannot come in contact with the Word of God without something taken place. You'll either be blessed or you will either be judged by it. The Word of God also refers to itself in Psalm 119, 105. The Word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. I, I just don't know what to do. I, I just don't know where to go. I, I just don't know how to act in this situation. Word of God is a, a lamp to show you the way. It's a light for your path to follow. So what am I saying? It's, I'm saying this. God's revealing himself to us through his word so that we might find ourselves and our way in this life and the life to come. That's the whole reason he's revealing himself. Now... If you were wanting to do this, there's a bus that is leaving Dallas at 12.15 today. I checked. You're not going to make it. But if you could, you could get on that bus at 12.15 and be on your way to Houston. But... If you don't show up, you won't be on it. Say, so, well, that makes sense. Well, the Lord was calling Ahaz to show up in faith and trust God's word. And if he, don't, if he does not get on it, then he's not going to get where he needs to be. 
Revelation is a gracious gift of God. The second thing, unbelief in the Word of God is simply and always unacceptable to God. Now, I know that sounds kind of harsh, but that's just the facts. Unbelief in the Word of God is simply and always unacceptable to God. Look there in verse 12. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I, I, I will not test the Lord. Isaiah said, Listen, house of David, it is not enough for you to try the patience of men. Will you also try the patience of God? Now, do not be fooled by verse 12. As if Ahaz is some spiritual paragon that we're supposed to follow his example. Verse 12 is betraying his heart. Verse 12 is saying to us that he is a self-righteous phony. All that business about testing the Lord. He's not concerned about the Lord. This is the same guy in 2 Kings 16 verses 2 through 4 who takes his son, his child, and offers him as a sacrifice to the God Molech. So is he really concerned about what God thinks? I don't think so. And even right now, as we're reading this text, he's actually planning an alliance with Assyria to defeat Israel and Syria. Ahaz is like a little mouse sending for an alley cat, Assyria, to help him kill two rats, Israel and Syria. See, he thinks he's got it all under control. Ahaz, Ahaz could say, well, I, I hear you, Lord, but I, I cannot believe. You ever heard somebody say they cannot believe? Well, that's not the case here. It's not that he cannot believe. The case is that he does not want to believe. He is a willful unbeliever. God does not want pious platitudes. God wants faith. God demands faith. God demands that we believe. Now, look at verse 13. It begins by saying, Isaiah said. Now, I want you to notice carefully in this text the interplay between verse 13 and verse 10. And what you will notice is this. What Isaiah says is what the Lord says. And what the Lord says is what Isaiah says. And sometimes you can't tell the difference between the two because they're the same. Isaiah is speaking for the Lord, so it's just as if the Lord is speaking himself. He says there in verse 13, listen. That's an imperative command. Listen. May I have your attention, please? House of David, is it, en is it not enough for you? That's plural. So I could read it this way. Is it not enough for y'all to try the patience of men? Will y'all also try the patience of my God? What he's saying to the king of Judah is this. Up until this point in time, you have yet to produce the perfect king. In spite of David, in spite of Solomon, in spite of any other notable kings, Josiah or Hezekiah, up until this point, you've not produced a perfect king. You've not produced a golden age. You're, you're trying the patience of men. Literally, Ahaz, you're wearing out the people. You ever, feel, you ever feel, feel worn out before an election? Yeah. He's wearing out the people with all of his talk about not testing the Lord 
And then he concludes verse 13 by saying, Will y'all, as a group of people, not, not just you Ahaz, but all the people of Judah, will y'all also try the patience of my God? Now notice the subtle, in verse 11, the Lord your God, but now because he's denied the sign, uh, Isaiah said, I offered him as your God, but you didn't receive it. So he's no longer your God. Now he's just simply my God. You failed. You missed out. Unbelief <laughs> blocks the channel of faith. It robs you of joy. And if not dealt with, it will destroy you. How so, Brother Tony? Hebrews 3.19, talking about the people of the Old Testament that failed to enter into the promised land. It says they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This verse is used four times in Scripture, or this phrase is used four times in Scripture. In the book of Habakkuk, the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, and the book of Hebrews. The just, the righteous, shall live by faith. Paul tells us twice in the book of Romans, Romans 11, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, I just can't believe. We'll read the Bible. You know what happens when you read the Bible? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you don't have enough faith, read the Bible. The Bible says it'll give you more faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And then Paul also reminds us in the 14th chapter of Romans, whatsoever is not from faith is sin. I, Ahaz, I'm going to give you a sign. You can have anything you want. What will you have? Well, I'll have nothing, Lord. And give me a, give me a double helping of nothing. And God says, that's fine. That's what I'll do. I'll give you nothing. I'm not going to bless you. Matter of fact, I'm going to judge you. Hebrews 11, 6, uh, 6 kind of sums up uh, faith for us. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You've got to have faith if you want to please God. But who needs to believe God when you can do it all yourself? Right? It's what Ahaz is thinking. Why, why do I need God? When I can pull all the strings and I can put all the pieces in place. Well, here's a comforting thought. When we ever have that notion like Ahaz had here, you know what God does? God will ultimately override all unbelief. You know how I know that? Let's continue reading. The third uh, non-negotiable here. The, the word of God is a double-edged sword of blessing and judgment. Now, I know we like this verse, and come December, we're going to love this verse, because this is a Christmas verse. Emmanuel, God with us. You know, I just have pictures of poinsettias and a baby in a manger. But let's keep it in the context, shall we? So, this is a promise here. But do you realize this is also a threat? This is both a promise and a threat. This is a message for the age. And this is a message for the ages. It's a message for the age that Isaiah lived in. But it's a message for the ages to all that would believe. God would not be denied. He, he gave Ahaz a chance. He offered a sign. He refused. They refused. And you know what God's take on it was? I'm going to give you a sign anyway. And here's what the sign is. Verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you, will give y'all a sign. See! Not, not just an imperative to look, but see as in like the word behold. Not, don't just look at it like something I can see physically, but something to believe physically and spiritually. Behold, the virgin will conceive. Well, that doesn't happen. 
That's a miracle. A virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel, which will be interpreted God with us. By the time he learns to reject uh, what is good and uh, or choose what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. See, this, what's all that notion about curds and honey there? Uh, that's the food of people that are living in poverty. And so, what he's saying here about this individual, this person by the name of Emmanuel, uh, before he's old enough to know wrong from right, he is going to be a child of poverty. And isn't that how Jesus grew up? Isn't that the state of his arrival in this world? Couldn't even afford an inn. He had to be born in a cattle trough in a manger. Well, there he is. Matthew 1.23 kind of settles the question. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel. See, God sets forth... God with us sets forth both his deity and his humanity. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we observed his glory as the one and only from the Father full of grace and truth. I don't get a lot of opportunities to preach on the virgin birth. But just let's just hit it a lick here, okay? Why is it important? Why is it important? Is it, is it an essential? I, I would say it's an essential. Why so? How important is the virgin birth? If Jesus is not born of a virgin, he is not the Savior and we are still in our sins. If Jesus is not born of a virgin, he is not the Son of God. If Jesus is not born of a virgin, he is not conceived by the Holy Spirit. If Jesus is not born of a virgin, he is not our coming king. How could a baby be born of a virgin without the help of a man? Luke 1.37 tells us simply how that can be. For nothing will be impossible with God. Isn't he just a man? Isn't he just a man? No, Jesus is not the Son of God because he was born of a virgin. He's virgin born because he is the Son of God and that's the only way that he could have come into this world. Or else he would have sin coursing through his veins. Now, we rejoice in that, do we not? Yes! But verse 16 is telling me that Emmanuel, God with us, has absolutely no relevance to Ahaz because he chose unbelief. Look at it there, verse 16. For before the boy knows how to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings, that is Israel and Syria. The land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. In other words, before he comes to this earth, those two entities will disappear into oblivion. And they did. See, you can allow the word of God to bless you. Emmanuel, God with us. Or you can allow... God's word to judge you. Listen to this verse out of the book of John. I find this verse very interesting. This is Jesus speaking. This is the virgin born son of God, Emmanuel speaking. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings my word, my word, has this as his judge. The word I have spoken, 
will judge him on the last day. See, this either blesses or it judges. Ahaz was assured in this passage that Syria and Israel and their alliance would fall. Ahaz was also assured in this passage that he would fall. Look at verse 17. The Lord will bring on you. That's singular. That's a word to Ahaz directly. The Lord will bring on you, your people, and your father's house such a time as has never been seen since Ephraim, the northern tribes, separated from Judah. And you know how he's going to do it? He's going to do it with Assyria. You know what he say? Because of unbelief, the very help that he sought was going to be the means of his destruction. Hmm. Verse 20 says that Assyria will be the Lord's razor in their judgment. The word of God blesses those who believe and it judges those who do not. Uh, listen, look here for just a second. There must be something in the water in DFW. You realize in the last six years, two seminary presidents have fallen. Do you realize that in the same DFW area, four prominent pastors, evangelical pastors, have fallen within the last six months. Do you realize that one more fell Thursday? And it crushes my heart because he's one of my heroes. My goodness, what in the world is going on? What's in the water, Brother Tony? Some of the details of any of those men. You can Google it and find out what was going in the, on in their life. I don't know. I don't have to know the specific details. Because I know enough of God's word that I know this. Their failure, their fall, was because of unbelief. How so? 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Sin of unbelief. They didn't believe that. Here's another one. James 1, 15. Then after lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Some did not believe. And instead of the word of God blessing them, the, God, the word of God was their demise. You may have walked through this door today with this attitude. Word of God, sermon, whatever. I can take it or leave it. I don't think so. You cannot take the word of God or leave it. It's your blessing or it's your undoing. What's God asking you to believe today? Broken relationship? You say, well, it's impossible. Well, I just, I've already said with God, nothing is impossible. Is God asking you to believe about a broken relationship? A wayward child? A financial concern? A diagnosis? What's God asking you to believe him for today? See, God is probing. As soon as this was open, God began to probe. And God's sword began to cut. And his hammer started to pulverize 
and his flame started to burn and it started to warm. It started to illuminate the darkness. And you know what? God's asking us to respond. Ask for a sign. Perhaps like Ahaz, you aren't listening. Well, what if, Brother Tony, God gave me a sign? Like he did Ahaz. Well, I would propose to you that he has in fact done that. He gave us the written word. And he gave us the living word. My thought on the matter is, what else does he need to give? How much can he give above what he has already given? Truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under the judgment, but has passed from death to life. Have you passed from death to life? I, I don't know. I only know of one. That would be me. Uh, that's the only person I can speak of, sure, of the surety that has passed from death into life. Romans 10 tells us this. This is the message of faith. Ahaz didn't want to hear that. But I'm, I'm giving it to you. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness. And one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. For the scripture says... Everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what will be your answer? What will you hear the call of him who did not spare his son, but gave him for us all? On earth there is no power. There is no depth nor height that could ever separate us from the love of God in Christ. Emmanuel, God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? Our God, our God, Emmanuel.